Chapter 20 American Graffiti There is a universal legal tradition that requires acts of a governmental authority to be marked by a seal, otherwise the acts are not authentic. Typically, a seal discloses the character of the authority it represents by means of an image which can be, and usually is, amplified by some sentence, phrase, or word. The first seal of the United States of America, designed to authenticate all governmental actions under the Declaration of Independence, was presented to Congress in August 1776. Created by an official committee consisting of Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, the seal illustrates an event based on Exodus 14, 1927. It is a cameo of Moses leading the Israelites through the parted waters while a chariot-bound pharaoh, wielding a sword and wearing the crown of tyranny, perishes in the maelstrom. Framing the picture are the words, Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. When I first became aware of this seal many years ago, I thought it demonstrated how intensely biblical was the faith of the Founding Fathers. But once I began discerning the hidden mistakes of American nationalism, the hidden makers of American nationalism, my thinking changed radically. I now see this seal, despite the biblical glow of the committee that designed it, as the profession of an intensely Roman Catholic faith. For there is a great disparity between biblical faith and Roman Catholic faith. Indeed, this disparity was the crux of Protestantism, which Pope Paul III commissioned the Society of Jesus to extirpate. Biblical faith regards the Bible alone, sola scriptura, apart from any other source, to be a sufficient and infallible rule of life. In the Bible's own words, all scripture is God-breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for counseling, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, completely outfitted to perform good works. 2 Timothy 3.16 Roman Catholic faith, on the other hand, while agreeing that the Bible is God-breathed, considers Scripture neither infallible nor sufficient in itself as a rule of life, unless so interpreted by the magisterium, the teaching authority of the Church, and then so pronounced by the invaluable Pope. At Paul III's Council of Trent, 1545-63, to which we have learned was closely supervised over its 18 years of existence by the Jesuits, it was decreed that the magisterium receives and venerates with a feeling of piety and reverence all the books of the Old and New Testaments, also the traditions, whether they relate to faith or morals, as having been dictated either orally by Christ or by the Holy Ghost, and preserved in the Catholic Church in unbroken succession. Over the centuries, Roman Catholic faith in Scripture, as modified by tradition, as pronounced by the magisterium and pope, has bound millions of consciences to a thousand doctrines not found in Scripture and either unknown or rejected by the apostles and early Christian fathers. The 1776 seal agrees with Roman Catholic teaching as much as it disagrees with the Bible. Whereas the caption, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God, is found nowhere in Scripture, It is the cornerstone of Bellarminian liberation theology. The Bible never condones rebellion, not even rebellion to those tyrants under whom God's own people, the Israelites, were obliged to suffer continuously. When Scripture mentions rebellion, it is almost always referring to the disobedience of the Israelites toward their God Yahweh. The 17th chapter of Proverbs teaches that the the evil man seeks rebellion, and 1 Samuel 15.23 admonishes that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The God of Scripture cannot be obeyed by evildoing and witchcraft. He will not be honored in the breach. However, sacred tradition authorizes anything in the service of Rome. 
cum finis est licitus etiam media sunt licita, the end justifies the means. Depicting rebellion as a salvational act in the 1776 seal further harmonizes with the magisterium on how the sinful soul of man is saved from eternal punishment. The magisterium concurs with the Bible that salvation is the free gift of God's grace, but adds the non-scriptural teaching that salvation can be lost if good works are not performed through the sacred channels of baptism, confession, and the Mass. Scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, 10, says that Jesus Christ does not shape his saviorhood with anyone or anything. You have been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. Yet the magisterium says that Christ is no savior without the sinner's cooperation with the church and its traditions. In fact, Scripture's account of the Exodus shows the departure from Egypt not to be a rebellion at all. When called by Yahweh to represent Israel before Pharaoh, Moses pled himself incapable, Exodus 3.11, uninformed, 3.13, unauthorized, 4.1, ineloquent, 4.10, unadapted, 4.13, unproven, 5.23, and uncredited credentialed, 612, hardly the audacious mindset of a great rebel leader. What Moses led was no rebellion but a sociological deliverance for which Yahweh alone claimed responsibility. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you can bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. Exodus 3.10.20 If Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson had wished the 1776 seal to express the true teaching of Scripture, they might have written, Yahweh removes tyrants for the his faithful. But even with a biblically correct motto, the seal fails the biblical standard. For it is, after all, a seal, authority represented by a graven image. Although the use of seals and images is one of Roman Catholicism's proudest sacred traditions, Scripture prohibits it. The only Israelite shown to rule with the seal is King Ahab, who did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. 1 Kings 16.30 Ahab's seal, apparently appropriated from ancient pagan, pagan tradition, was employed by his wife, the quintessentially wicked Jezebel, to commit fraud and murder. Scripture warns of an unlimited potential for evil inherent in graven image seals. The Apostle of Christ understood this principle well. They saw the Pharisees demand Jesus show them a token of his authority, and what Jesus showed them was not an image but scripture, the book of Jonah, Matthew 12.39. Paul the Apostle had no seal except the people he evangelized, for the seal of my apostleship are those of you in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 9.2. Indeed, the seal of the body of Christ is represented in Scripture not by the mitre and crossed keys of the Holy See, or the doves, flames, Bibles, bare crosses, and sunbursts of the Protestant denominations, but by Scripture alone. The foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knows his own, and let Christ's faithful depart from iniqu iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 The early Christians, from whose faith is historically regarded as the best informed of any generations, rigorously opposed the making of images or likenesses of any kind. Scripture has taught them well that Yahweh's people always suffered terribly, terrible calamity whenever they violated the commandment not to identify themselves or their God with any graven images or any likeness of anything. Exodus 24. Edward Bevan's Holy Images, an in inquiry into idolatry and image worship in ancient paganism and Christianity, cites three important early churchmen who forbade images, 
Clement of Alexandria taught that images were not true and were forbidden by Yahweh in order that we might not direct our attention to sensible, sensible objects, but might proceed to the intelligent, intelligential. Origen held that images drag the soul down instead of directing the mind to divine, invisible reality. Tertullian instructed the servants of God to avoid every form of imagery, even secular art. Indeed, as Bevan points out, Christians of the first and second centuries placed visual artists in the class with harlots, drunkards, brothel keepers, and actors. But for thousands of years, Mediterranean cultures had been receiving their religious and political information from myths narrated by visual art. Paulinus, Bishop of Nola, said in his congregations, they said of his congregations, they are not devoid of religion, but not able to read. This was Paulinus's excuse for beseeching the Bishop of Rome to permit him to teach with graven images. Paulinus had forgotten, or perhaps had never learned, that the basis of the gospel of Christ was above all literary. Else why had its author prohibited graphic likenesses? Knowing this, the apostles devoted a large part of the, the evangelical process to spreading literacy. Blessed is he who reads, Revelation 1.3. Even so, the Apostle Peter foresaw the time of Paulinus, Bishop of Nola, a time when false teachers among you shall bring in damnable heresies denying the Lord. 2 Peter 2 1. What more damnable heresy could there be than depicting a God who condemns images with an image? Could such a God even be depictable by an image? Wouldn't an image purporting to be him have to be in reality, by sheer force of logic, the image of another god? The Apostle Paul, aware of the compelling nature of images and their definitive incapacity to teach Jesus and the gospel, warned the Corinthians how easily a false teacher could lead them to another Jesus, another gospel. 2 Corinthians 11.4 The time was very close, Paul knew when Christians will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers who will switch them from truth to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3, 4. And what are graven images but the very grammar of myths? The switch began noticeably happening in the 3rd century when teachers like Paulinus of Nola began instructing from pictures from which, for which Paulinus was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. With Constantine a century later, as we've seen, a powerful new Christian visual language developed. Old mythic icons were renamed to fit Bible stories, and an iconic Christianity was spread through pagan images processed by missionary adaptation. What the new converts were not taught is that Scripture categorically rejects such attempts to iconize its contents, and that therefore, again by sheer force of logic, the likenesses upon whom they reverently gazed were no more than the gods and goddesses originally pictured other gods of other Gospels. Archaeology traces these gods and their Gospels back to the very earliest Babylonian cathedrals. It is in these cathedrals, erected nearly 4,000 years before the Christian era, that the Roman Catholic sacred iconographic tradition was born. We shall explore this subject in some detail in a forthcoming chapter. Congress refused to adopt the 1776 seal. We may never know why. There is no record of any debate, only the notation that the seal was ordered to lay on the table. Five years later, in the summer of 1781, a fleet of 25 French vessels arrived in Chesapeake Bay with more than 20,000 soldiers accompanied by 90 Roman Catholic chaplains and God only knows how many secularized Jesuits. A month later, the British Army surrendered to General Washington at Yorktown. The legend-spinning visible war was over at last. 
In June 1782, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams were meeting in Paris to perfect a treaty with, with envoys of the newly elect, elected British Prime Minister Robert Petty. We recall Petty, Lord Shelburne, the ubiquitous Jesuit of Berkeley Square, who teamed with Lord Butte to conclude the French and Indian Wars in terms that had made the revolution inevitable. Franklin and Adams found themselves approaching the negotiating table without a national seal. Nothing they might do on behalf of the United States could be valid without a seal. This was the exigency that moved Congress to adopt on June 28 the seal designed by Charles Thompson and William Barton. The seal is written in Kabbalah, that style of allegorical communication composed, composed of seemingly unrelated symbols, numerals, and phrases. A piece in La Charivari, number 18, Paris, 1973, discussing certain symbolic motifs used by the enlightened French artist Nicolas Poussin, explains the practical advantage of Kabbalistic works. A single word suffices to illuminate connections which the multitude cannot grasp. Such works are available to everyone, but their significance addresses itself to an elite. Above and beyond the masses, sender and receiver understand each other. Kabbalah goes beyond mere secret communication. Supposedly, it thrusts the sender into direct contact with the living powers and forces of the universe and through them with the eternal source of all manifestation, explains Henrietta Bernstein in her Kabbalah Primer. In other words, you make contact with God. To a Kabbalist Gnostic Illuminatus, whose special knowledge has liberated him from the clutch of matter and is speeding him toward the pure light of godliness, Kabbalah is the royal art, a closed body of knowledge sacred to the elect. Since the great seal is written in the language of Kabbalah, it appears to be a veritable Gnostic constitution. In terms well known to initiates and God Almighty, it sets forth the origin, nature, purpose, and plan of American government. Of course, as Charles Thompson and Manley Hall have intimated, the initiates will never disclose to outsiders the meaning of the seal's elements. But God Almighty is not so aloof. He does not resist inquiries, nor is he a respecter of persons. Contrary to the Kabbalists' boast of privileged access, Scripture promises more light to any mind that seeks it from God in person. Shining that light on commonly available histories of rulers and religions, anyone can trace the seal's elements back to their ancient origins and in the end know as much as if not more than the Gnostics. On the front or obverse side of the seal we find an eagle clutching an olive branch and thirteen arrows with a banner in his beak inscribed with the motto A Pluribus Unum. The earliest images of sacred eagles have been found in that region of present-day Iraq, once known as Babylon. The eagle was identified with the Babylonian sky god Anu. When Anu entered sacred Roman iconography as Jupiter, the eagle was still his mascot. For, the more, than, for more than 2,000 years since the death of Rome's first emperor, Julius Caesar Jupiter's eagle has signified Rome's imperial power, imperial meaning the right of the Caesars to make laws and enforce them. In many a church, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike, the Bible from which lessons are publicly read rests on a hardwood lectern carved in the shape of a magnificent eagle, yet in the pages of the very, this very Bible, God forbids carved images of eagles. What, then, does the eagle signify if not a power indifferent to Scripture? And I found this eagle lectern when I was studying St. Corona in Aachen Cathedral, and it happens to have a bat on the inverse side. 
which I thought was kind of interesting considering the bat virus. The brilliant cloud hovering over the eagle's head in the great seal is the Aegis. The Aegis is a goatskin. We have already examined how scripture equates the goat with worldly power and separation from God. When Jupiter was a baby, he was nursed by a she-goat na named Amathea. The priestly artists often portrayed the adult Jupiter as a satyr, having a man's body with the horns and hair and legs of a goat. When Amathea died, Jupiter made the Aegis out of her hide. The Aegis of the Great Seal glorifies thirteen. 13 five-pointed stars, or pentagrams. Each pentagram represents an original state. In Gnostic symbology, the pentagram is identified with Jupiter's wife, Venus. There is a natural reason for this. A dedicated observer from a fixed location over an eight-year period will discern that the planet Venus travels a unique celestial pathway that exactly describes a pentagram. Carl Lungemann, in Dictionary of Symbols, has written, As the orbit of Venus is closer to the Sun than the Earth's position, she has never seen more than 48 degrees from the Sun. During a period of 247 days, Venus is visible as the evening star, that is, within 48 degrees or less of the Sun after the Sun has set. Then Venus comes too close to the Sun for us to see her. She remains invisible for 14 days, then reappears as the morning star, or eastern star, immediately before the sun rises in the east. For 245 days, we can see Venus each morning at dawn before she again disappears into the sun's light by getting too close to the sun. Venus is now invisible for 78 days. On the 79th evening, she appears again in the west immediately after the setting sun. Now she is the evening star once more. If one knows the ecliptic, that is, the great circle of the celestial sphere, that is, the apparent path of the sun among the stars, and can pinpoint the present position of the planets in relation to the constellations of fixed stars in the zodiac, one can mark the exact place in the 360 degrees of the zodiac where the where the morning star first appears shortly before sunrise after a period of invisibility. If we do this, wait for the morning star to appear again 584 days later, the synodic orbital time of Venus, and mark its position in the zodiac and then repeat this process until we have five positions of Venus as the morning star, we will find that exactly eight years plus one day have passed. If we then draw a line from the first point marked to the second point marked, then to the third, and so on, we end up with a pentagram. Only Venus possesses the five-pointed star sign. Not one of the innumerable stars above can recreate this by its own orbit. Charles Thompson, the great seal's co-designer, led a group of dedicated observers of Venus. The first coordinated scientific experiment of the American Philosophical Society, the club Thompson founded for politically radical young professionals, focused on Venus's celestial pathway. On the evening of June 3, 1769, with colleagues stationed at three sites in Pennsylvania and Delaware, Thompson and five others watched from the public observatory on State House Square in Philadelphia an eclipse caused by the transit of Venus across the sun. The goddess Venus, as we've seen, was absorbed by missionary adaptation into the Roman Catholic sacred tradition as the Virgin Mary. The adapters even ascribed to Mary the Venusian epithet, Queen of Heaven a title never ascribed to Mary in the Bible. Queen of Heaven in Scripture names only one personage, personage, and that is Ishtar, the Babylonian Venus. Most faithful Catholics, historically insulated from Scripture by the Magisterium and the Inquisition, have not known this. 
Jeremiah 44 explains how the Israelites violated their covenant with Yahweh by praising the Queen of Heaven, and in turn lost their dignity and property, freedom and everything to, ba to the Babylonians. Scripture teaches also that the Babylonian interests have much to gain from inducing souls to praise the Queen of Heaven, and as we shall later see, their gain is divinely approved. The term Queen of Heaven appears nowhere else in the Old and New Testaments but at Jeremiah 44, and there exactly five times. Did Jeremiah know that Venus's celestial trail delineated five points? And did the other 35 writers of the Bible's 66 books know as well? Did all of these men who wrote in different languages over a period of more than a thousand years conspire not to mention Queen of Heaven in order to preserve Jeremiah's five mentions so that the link between A, the Queen of Heaven, B, the five-pointed path of Venus, and C, the curse resulting from praising her would stand as a divine lesson for the rest of eternity? Or did it just happen that way by accident? Or, as the Bible teaches, were Jeremiah and his co-authors inspired by the author of all creation to say and not say things for reason, for reasons beyond their individual understanding? So, when I was looking at the original seal, I found an image of it in St. Paul's Chapel at Trinity Church in New York City next to the pew used by George Washington. The rays of light are breaking through a cloud as they should be and as seen in other early realizations of the Great Seal. And you see here, today's seal, the rays are within the cloud. And I'm not sure what that means. And it's clearly not a bald eagle. Ben Franklin famously said it looked like a turkey. Formerly, the eagle faced toward the arrows of its left talon, arrows being symbolic of war. Today, the eagle faces right toward the olive branch. And here's an image of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's proposed seal of the United States, Hengist and Horsa, who were the Romulus and Remus of Anglo-Saxon England. The Great Seal's eagle holds a banner in its beak inscribed A Pluribus Unum. This phrase, which appears on American coinage as well, is popularly understood to signify the melting of many people into one nation, of many, one. Or to identify the coin as one of many identical coins. The Gnostic understanding of this phrase, however, borders on the psychedelic. According to Manley Hall, E Pluribus Unum refers to the ancient Bacchic rites, which he says was a forerunner to Freemasonry. Mysterious and fantastic, the Bacchic rites are built upon the following storyline. In a time before the creation of mankind, the twelve titans caused Bacchus, Jupiter's beautiful son, to become fascinated by his own image in a mirror. Enthralled by himself, Bacchus is seized by the titans. They kill him, tear him to pieces, boil the pieces in water, and afterwards roast and eat them. This grieves all his loved ones, hence his name, from Bacca, to weep or lament. The strewn body parts of Bacchus become the four elements of matter. One of Bacchus's sisters, the Virgin Minerva, rescues his sacred heart from the four elements and places it before Jupiter in heaven. From heaven, Jupiter hurls thunderbolts at his son's murderers and reduces the titans to ashes. The rains further reduce the ashes, mingling with the four elements to slime. From this evil slime, Jupiter forms mankind, a titanic embodiment from which the Bacchic idea or rational soul must be released. The Bacchic idea is released by evil slime's sexual energy, especially when facilitated by alcoholic drink. Hence, Bacchus is associated with grapevines, wild dancing, phallic symbols, and fornication. 
when death and sex have rescued the rational soul from the four slimy corners of the earth, a transfigured, eternal Bacchus is resurrected as the flaming sun. He is a pluribus unum, one from many, a resurrection symbolized by the pentagram, the one rising out of the four to make five. This, says Manley Hall, is the magical formula of man the human soul rising from the bondage of the animal nature. The pentagram is the true light, the star of the morning, marking the location of five mysterious centers of force, the awakening of which is the supreme secret of white magic. With E Pluribus Unum, flowing from his beak, Jupiter's eagle preaches the Bacchic gospel. It is a gospel of salvation that antedates that of Jesus Christ by many, many centuries. The Bacchic gospel was preached and played out in the pagan cults. A holy virgin would ritually rescue the Son of God's sacred heart from the slime of humanity imprisoning the soul, the Son's soul. Each cult initiate, a fractional part of the Son's soul, supposedly gained an increasing amount of knowledge from mind-altering substances and sexual ecstasy administered, for money, of course, by the temple priests and priestesses. The initiate looked forward to being released from his slimy humanity by ever-increasing knowledge. He yearned to be reunited ultimately with the Sacred Heart in heaven, resurrected and transfigured for all eternity. This salvational plan, or some variation of it, can be found at the core of all the secret or mystery religions, cults of empire. It persists from the earliest Babylonian prototype right on down through the Great Seal. It has succeeded not because it calls for repentance from sin, but because it makes sin an asset in a process of self-deification. The Bacchic Gospel serves an economy of sin management, in which sins are forgiven upon the payment of money or performance of some act of contrition valuable to society. It is about people control. Because it prospers on the addictive nature of fornication and mind-altering substances, it naturally facilitates sex and booze and drugs and all their destructive fallout in order to have a context in which to make itself useful. Unlike the Christian gospel, which conditions forgiveness of sins upon repentance, and if he repents, forgive him, Luke 17.3, the Bacchic gospel forgives upon the tendering of appropriate sacrifices to the priest of the appropriate deity. The congeniality of this gospel to secular government and Roman Catholicism speaks for itself.